Hello everyone, welcome to chapter 6, Applications of Integration. Our focus here is to find volumes using cross-section. We previously saw area, how to find the area, and we found that definite integral gives us the area, and in particular, using definite integral as it is gives us the net area, and if you took the absolute value of them um, of the, over the negative regions, it gave you the total area. Now, um, area is two-dimensional, so we are talking about volumes, which means we move to the three-dimensional shape, and uh, we see that area will be helpful in expanding to the third dimension. Now, I mentioned that uh, when we talk about volumes, it's a 3D uh, image. So, it's a, so take any 3D figure and cut it into thin slabs. So as you can see, uh, the blue uh, slice is a, is a cross-section um, in that 3D figure. And what we're saying is, if we were to slice cross-sections like that, and if we found their volume, then we can add them all up and we'll get the volume of the entire 3D figure. So what, why, uh, so if it was a 2D figure, meaning if you're talking about the area, if you took uh, one rectangle, right, one slice of it, one slab, that slice was a rectangle, it was a two-dimensional image. But here, it's a 3D figure, so when you take a slice of it, that will also be a 3D uh, version, right? So to kind of help you see this, you can see that uh, right now you can't see this slab here, this cross-section as a 3D, so I'm going to show you um, a more detailed uh, view of it. Now, if you can see this outline here, right, this outline here as this, now that outline is looks like a 2D figure because you can't see the thickness of that slab, you know, of that cut. So uh, we can think of it as the flat region, and that flat region will be the area. But when you cut it as a slice, right, it's a slab, there will be a height to it because of the thickness. The thickness is your height, basically. And so the thickness is this area that's kind of lined up to form that thickness, right? It's uh, kind of layered up to get to that thickness, to, the, to that height. So it's the same as saying, well, this is now a 3D figure. This is like 2D because it's the area. And this is 3D, three dimensions. The three dimensions would be this area in the bottom times the height to account for the thickness. So you have the, uh, the, the use of area times the height to give you the volume. So area times the height gives you the volume. And uh, that is the idea we're going to use. So what we're saying is, well, this is a slab, right? So if I can slice another slab from here, that slab will give me a volume, right? Like that, if I added up all the volumes according to Riemann sum, the summation of all the volumes would give me the, um, the volume of the entire 3D figure. And uh, to, to make it uh, robust in terms of not approximation but exact volume, We'll take the limit, n approaches infinity, of those Riemann sums of volumes, and that will give us the exact volume. So what we learned here is the volume of a slab will be the cross-sectional surface area, right? That's the cross-sectional surface area, the base area, times the height, or you can also call it as the width. Now, we do know that the volume of a rectangle, because we are so used to the rectangle, let's think of a volume of a rectangular slab. We know that the volume of a rectangular slab is length times width times height. Okay. So uh, what we can see is if I were to draw a three-dimensional figure like this, so my 3D figure is uh, some kind of an irregular 3D figure, but uh, it's a solid like this. And if you took a cross section, you can see that you have a rectangular slab. I wanted to give you something that you can visualize as a rectangular slab. So if you look at this uh, pink uh, slab, that could be my, um, you know, the, the slab that I cut out. So that's, um, um, you can use that as a sample to find the volume of that particular rectangular slab. And uh, that will be length times width times height. Okay. So... So we can um, think of it as a regular cube or a regular rectangular piece or anything that's, uh, that's, that looks like a, a rectangular slab, and we could use it. I have a 3D figure here, and uh, it is, um, it's, it's a little irregular 
it's not a regular rectangular prism but uh, you see that when you take a cross section like the pink one you do get a rectangular slab and that's what you will find the volume for and the vo volume it's just for this one slab but if you keep slicing this uh, 3d figure into infinite number of rectangular slabs no matter what the um, the length width and the height is but if you found the volume for each one of them and added them up you'll get the volume of this rectangular slab so what happens here is if I would call this let's say this thing as my uh, this as my X this as my Y And the, and the thickness would be my width. Okay, so that would be. So think of the uh, idea of how you have the base, which is this. Let's just focus on this this rectangle here. Okay. So this is my length, and let's say this is my width. That will just give me for for this just this part, right? That will give me the area for just this part. Now I have this width. This width. Here. Um, uh, in the sense this will be the height. The thickness. So that will be my, my height. So length times width will give me the area. So this gives me. Let me use the blue because that was the blue. That gives me, gives me the area. And this gives me the thickness. The height. We like to call it the height here. But basically, that's your thickness for that slab. So area times the thickness gives you the volume, and that is what we were trying to uh, we're trying to do here in finding the volume for each slab. Okay. So area, you, you know, if you relate it quickly to the integral, we are able to see that the area is uh, uh, your uh, your definite integral. So trying to expand on this, I'll say volume of let's call this as the kth rectangular slab okay, which is a 3d figure so volume of this kth rectangular flag will be area of this rectangular this the slab right the bottom the base of this so uh, this is happening at some ck let's say okay some point some point because it's the x-axis let's call this a ck on the x-axis or xk anything is fine I'm using CK because we use that CK uh, concept in uh, in Riemann sum. That times the thickness. You know, the thickness is the width, and the width we called it as delta x. I'm kind of going quickly here, okay? So uh, I'm not trying to rename all these things all over, all over a thickness. This is for just one slab, isn't it? So if I had um, divided this into finite number of slabs, then I'll have the, the total volume to be the sum of all those slabs where k can go from 1 to n, right, delta x. But then we know that with the Riemann sum, we're saying, oh, don't divide it into just n slabs. Go for infinite number of slabs. And then we can allow the limit to go for, for n to go to infinity. And then we could take the sum of these from 1 to n. Right? But then we've already seen that the limit of, of the summation of length times width, right? The area of a rectangle. This is already... Your integral a to b, a of x. We've seen this in Riemann sum for area. But remember this is in volume. So that times the dx. Delta x becomes dx in the integral form. Is, is now given to, to be this cool integral a to b, a of x dx. Now remember this is when we integrate with respect to x. And we saw that we could also integrate with respect to y. So if that's the case, then we go from c to d, right? 
a of y dy and this will be when we integrate with respect to y. So this, that's your volume by cross section. So I'll give you a, um, a formal definition here. So uh, what I have here is the, is the definition of the volume and uh, steps on how to calculate the volume of a solid. So let's look at the definition. The volume of a solid of integrable cross-sectional area A of x from x equals a to x equals b is the integral of a from a to b, integral of area a. So v is integral a to b, a of x dx. So we got that. So whatever be the shape, if it's a rectangle, where if your cross-section comes out with a base or the surface area as a rectangle, then you use the area of a rectangle. If that comes out to be a circle, then you use the area of a circle and so on, right? That's why it's generalized for uh, as a of x to indicate whatever the area comes out to be, uh, the, the shape. And um, the way we find uh, or calculate the volume is they're asking us to first sketch the solid because you need to figure out how the, what the shape is. And then a typical cross-section, once you get your 3D graph, then you can do a, a cross-section. Then find the formula for the area. Again, that comes from your cross-section, right? The cross-section will reveal what kind of shape it will be. Is it a rectangle? Is it a circle? Or, or what, what, what kind of a shape could that be? And once you figure that out, you will refine the limits of integration like we did before, and then integrate the area to find the volume. Okay? So let's start uh, maybe, you know, simple. Now, if I gave you a graph that looked like, say, this, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, um, I say this is, let's say this goes from 1 all the way to 5 here. It's not to scale, so it's obviously not going to look accurate here. Something like this, okay? And I'm asking you to find the volume of the solid. Okay. To find the volume of the solid, I have to first draw a cross section. A cross section would be how you would slice this. Right? It's a cylinder, so when you slice it, you're going to get a circle. It looks like an oval because of the view, but you know it's a cylinder, so when you slice it, it's going to be a circle. So uh, the cross section is a circle. And uh, and if you looked at uh, the, this uh, width here, you know the diameter. I would say. Of this uh, of the cylinder, it goes from one to three, right? So right in the middle will be the center. So that middle must be the two, because you're going from one to three. So two must be the middle value. So in fact, you do know the um, the the radius of this circle. But let's go uh, step by step. So they said sketch the solid and 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 a typical cross section. We got that. Find the formula for a of x. A of x will be the area of a circle, which is pi x squared. Remember, we are not writing pi r squared. I'm right, keeping them all in terms of, um, you know, x or y, integrating with respect to x or with respect to y. I'm doing it with respect to x here, so pi x squared. Okay. So then if I do the volume, volume is from a to b, a of x, dx. So what this means is this a of x will be the area of the circle of the cross section. And this dx actually indicates the thickness. In this case, this is only one slice, one slab. So if I keep adding all of them, I should get the entire rectangle. That entire rectangle will be the length of the solid, right? I hope you can see that. Right? This is just one of them. So if, if I were to slice them everywhere throughout, and if I added them up, that will give me the length of this. So the thickness is that. Oops, see, I told you. Sometimes we lose. Uh, okay. Now coming back to the volume. A to B. A to B is from 1 to 5. Left end to the right end. Pi x squared dx. 
it's all inbuilt in the formula, so we, we really find it very helpful. So 1 to 5 pi. Now x squared, x squared is the radius. The radius is, we found the radius to be 1, right? The 2 to 3 or 1 to 2, the radius is 1. So that's pi integral 1 to 5 dx pi times x 1 to 5 because derivative, I mean integral of dx is x pi times 5 minus 1 oops, minus 1 which is 4 pi. So you found the volume of the cylinder to be 4 pi. In fact, if you check this geometrically I use this uh, simple example so that we could also check it geometrically. You know that this solid is a cylinder. We call it solid just to generalize it. So even if you recognize the shape, sometimes it's better to keep it as, treat it as a solid whose shape you don't know because that's what calculus helps you to do. It says it doesn't matter what your shape is, if, if it's irregular or regular, you know, like a known shape. Whatever be the shape, if you can find its area, then you got um, a way to integrate that area to find the volume. But because we're using geometry here, volume of a cylinder is given to be pi r squared h. And then we have pi um, here, and radius is 1, right? And the height, which is basically the length of the cylinder in this case, right? If, you, if it was uh, sitting upright, then we would call it the height because it's sideways i'm using the word length but you know that's actually the height so that's uh, one to five isn't it one to five so after the distance would be five minus one so that's basically four pi so you were able to verify this um, of course geometrically too uh, now we have something called solids of revolution What this means is that we will be generating 3D figures by revolving them or rotating them about the x-axis, about the y-axis. So when you rotate them, you get this volume, right? Because you're rotating it and you're seeing it as a 3D figure. And uh, when, when we do that, the advantage is that because of that smoothness of the rotation, you are able to slice them, slice that, that 3D figure to obtain disks. And these disks are going to be circular in nature. So we really like that because the cross-section of these volumes of uh, volume of a solid of revolution will always produce a circular disk. So we have two ways of doing it. So I'm going to first look at the disk method. And uh, because uh, in the disk method we said the dis disks are circular, uh, your uh, volume formula, which is integral a to b, a of x dx, can be now fixed for a of x to be a, um, uh, a circle. So the radius of a circle, I'm sorry, the area of a circle is pi r squared. Pi is a constant, but r will be a function of x. Okay. r is a function of x because it's to do with the x-axis, right? That's it's a function. That's your um, that's that's where it varies basically. Your pi won't vary. Pi is a constant, so we have pi r squared. So we're calling it r of x. It's a function of x squared dx. So this is a general formula. When we do a a problem you'll begin to see uh, how to apply this okay so here comes the problem a region between the curve y equals square root of x x between 0 and 4 and the x-axis is revolved about the x-axis to generate a solid find its volume this is solid of revolution so you're revolving to generate a solid so you have to understand that uh, this idea helps us uh, draw a 2D you know, picture really, but it will help you to see that you are able to generate a solid from this 2D. Okay, what do I mean by that? So let me draw this y equals x, okay. square root of x. 
and it's going from 0 to 4. Right. Now, if we were to revolve this, that's what they're saying, revolve this around the x-axis, so you're rotating it about the x-axis. This calls for imagination, okay? You're rotating this about the x-axis, so I can kind of give you the shape. Can you see that the shape looks like this? So you're kind of revolving this. And so if I took a cross section of this, that's going to be a disc with this as the radius, right? The radius actually happens to be the height of the graph from the x-axis. And that's the reason why we like to write the radius as a function of x, because it's, it's, it corresponds to the original function, y equals root x. And so your uh, y equals root x becomes your r of x, because it's a function of x, and that is your, that is your radius. So what we're saying, and this this uh, uh, direction, th this tells you we're revolving around, uh, about the x-axis. And what we're saying is that you, you can visualize the 3D picture, but uh, just drawing just the true 2D, the y equals root x, itself gives you the idea that if you rotated it, that's going to give you the height of the, um, the graph, which actually in the 3D version will be the radius of the circular disk that is generated. So, you know, this is the, the pot-like thing is your solid. So, anyway, coming to the problem. Volume is going to be from A to B, A of X, DX. This is the standard general version. But we know that this is a volume of revolution, which produced a circular disk. And because of that, we go from A to B, pi of R of X, squared dx. All right, so that means we can now have uh, the n's from 0 to 4 pi. We just saw that r of x is nothing but your, the height of the function, so y equals root x, so that is root x, the whole squared dx. Now that is very, very convenient because you have, let me bring the pi out, 0 to 4 root x the square, uh, when squared will be just x dx, x squared over 2, 0 to 4, 4 squared over 2. I can bring the 2 out as well, uh, just for variety. I'm keeping the 2 in there. But you're only substituting for the x. 16 over 2 is 8. That's going to be a 0, so 8 pi. So the volume, right, the volume is your, is given to be 8 pi. So I can give you a better image too if you wanted a, a 3D image of this. So here is the better image here, and you can see the circular disk looking nicer here. Uh, the, the circular look is, is really cool because it's giving you that nice 3D view. The thing is, we can't really draw well all the time, and that is where this really comes in handy, being able, able to visualize it from a 2D uh, uh, image or 2D drawing. So uh, to give you a kind of the uh, idea of solid of revolution, I'll give you a series of shapes. And you can see that when we rotate it, it's going to look cool each time. So let's say... I'll just focus on the x-axis, okay? And we're going to rotate it about the x-axis. And this is our graph, okay? If you were to rotate around the x-axis, what do you think will be the shape of this? Um, or what will be the solid that is generated? That's the question. And uh, you can see that if I were to draw this, you know, this is rotating, right? It's going to be a solid, so it's kind of smooth. So I'm ba basically drawing a mirror image, and I can see that it's going to look like this, right? A cylinder. And if you took the cross section of this cylinder, you're going to get a disk, isn't it? A circular disk, of course.
then let's say you had a semicircle like this. You are rotating this about the x-axis. And what happens is I draw the semicircle, but I also see kind of a, a mirror image of that. That's bad. Okay. But then it's not a circle. It's going to be actually a sphere, right? So it's this is the closest I can draw a sphere, but you can see that uh, when you rotate it, it's going to give you a sphere. So one half is enough to see the rotation go around, right? You don't need to see the full thing, and that is the neat idea here. In fact, for that matter, if I were to draw, uh, let's say, a rectangle, or, or a triangle, sorry, a triangle like this, and if I were to rotate this, you can see that I will be drawing this triangle again. And by basically getting its mirror image on this side, but because it's rotating, it will be kind of pinched here, but on the right side you can see that it will be a, a funnel, basically a cone. And uh, what's cool here again, in each of these cases, if you took a cross section, a slice of it, that cross section will be a circular disk. And that height of the of the graph will match with the radius of that circular disk, no matter where you take the, uh, the slice, isn't it? And that is why we like that, because it travels with the function. And uh, we're going to look at this in the next concept, but um, I'll also kind of introduce it right here, because we don't have to wait. Now, what happens if my, um, let's say, the graph was not really hugging the x-axis? How do I rotate this? about the x-axis. Can we rotate it? Of course we can rotate it. So what we have then is this, something like this, right? Yeah. But then when you're rotating, there is kind of like a hole because it's not touching the x-axis. So what you see is it's basically like a, a, a cylinder with a hole in it, or in other words, like a paper towel, right? So this is also a 3D figure, but it's like a paper towel. And what happens if you took a cross section of this? You get something that's like, it's a circular disk with the hole cut off in the middle. And what we call this is washer. Okay. So it's a washer if you have a hole in the circular disk, basically. So you have like two radii, right? There's, a radi there's an outer radius and an inner radius. We'll get to that, but what I'm saying is it's possible to rotate it, uh, but when it's hugging the x-axis, you get this solid without any hollow space. Yeah, you get a complete solid. And for the time being, in this section, we're only focusing on these kind of solids. Okay. But what we're saying also is that we can get a... Um, uh, get a, a washer shape uh, as well, or a solid as that. Now let's say you got, we were given some random, uh, random graph. Okay, we've been looking at things like this, right? If you were to rotate this, how will this look? So I'm, I'll use the same thing. I say, okay, if I were to rotate this, I'm going to get something similar to it. And this will be the shape of this solid, right? So then if I took the cross section for this one, okay, that looks bad. I will make this side solid and this one. If I took the cross section and if I took the radius, that will be the, the radius will be the height of this graph, which is your given function. And if you can always set it to go from A to B. So that you can see this as a regular problem by where some function is given to us, right? And if you rotated it, you get a solid. Like in this case, it looks more like a like a flower pot or something like that.
So uh, uh, in, in all these cases, we get a circular disk as the cross section. And that is the reason why we were able to use that formula that involved uh, the, the area of a circle. So I'd like to make a bold statement here and say any function f of x when revolved about the x-axis, okay, because you're revolving, there's a smoothness to it, and that will always produce a circular slice. Cool? So what we're saying then is, um, you can think of this as volume by slicing. That's another name for the disk method. What we saw was it's integral a to b, a of x dx, and then we upgraded this a of x and we said that's going to be a to b pi r of x r squared, right? Pi r squared dx. Now we know that this r, the radius, radius equals the height of the graph, which is the same as the function, right? The height of the graph is the function, because that's how you know how the function moves up, down, and all that. That movement is judged by the height of the graph. So that is basically a function. So your radius is nothing but your function, so which is your f of x. Instead of calling it r of x, I can actually call it f of x because my radius matches with the height of the function. And that means I can upgrade it one more level and call this r of x instead as f of x, the whole squared dx. Now because pi will always be constant, you can actually, in your formula itself, keep the pi out, a to b, f of x, whole squared dx. This is even better because we, we uh, know that the radius will be the function, so we are actually using the function directly. Okay? So this is called the method of disks. Because what we're saying is, well, if we stacked up all these circular disks, we will get the volume of the entire solid. So let's do this upcoming problem. Find the volume of the solid of revolution where y equals 3 root x on 1 to 4 is revolved about the x-axis. Now because of all the upgrades we've given to the existing the volume formula, uh, what is really neat is you really don't have to draw. Right? You don't have to draw because you, you can use the function, the given function, in your volume uh, formula directly. Because the volume formula simply allows you to plug in for f of x. This is f of x squared dx. You can go ahead and complete the problem. But uh, it's always nice to have the graph. So, so that's uh, y equals 3 root x. And we are focusing on this from... 1 to 4. Okay. You can get the corresponding y coordinates and all that. But what I'm trying to show you is that we will then have and then this would be this is how it would look if you were to draw this. right? Anyways, uh, we don't have to draw is what I'm trying to say. A to B, that's 1 to 4, because that's your interval. F of X, F of X is 3 root X, and that has to be squared dx. See how easy that is. Pi, 1 to 4, 3 squared, remember to square the 3 as well, and root X squared is X, so 9X dx. I'll bring the 9 also out, and X dx will be X squared over 2, and I'll apply the limit. 
I can bring the 2 out 9 pi over 2 and just work on the x. That's going to be 4 squared minus 1 squared. 9 pi over 2. 16 minus 1. Okay, that's 15. Multiply it out. Your volume comes out to be 135 pi over 2. Voila. Now that is really, really neat. And all this was because we replace the r, the radius, with the given function, because the radius is the height. And I want to, to always remember this origin, okay? Because when we keep upgrading it, we sometimes forget the origin, and when a problem looks different than what we've been seeing, we tend to panic. So uh, my suggestion is that if you, if you um, remember the origin, there's no need to panic, because you can actually work on the understanding there, where the understanding is that the radius is nothing but the function, the height of the graph. And if you see that connection, then you'll be able to manage problems that do not typically look like one of our solved examples. What we have here is uh, that we are given y equals root x is revolved around y axis and is bound by y equals 2 and y equals 0. Find the volume. Okay, we have to be careful because we are told that it's now being rotated about the y axis. So uh, if you were to draw this graph, I need to give more room on the y side, right, because of the, um, because it's rotated about the y-axis. So this is y equals root x, and I show the arrow around the y-axis. It's from 0 to 2. y is from 0 to 2. Okay. So y is 2. Okay, that means x will be 4, right? Now uh, we have to, I want to draw another one too so that you can see how I've constructed it. So if this is like this, then you see a corresponding one like this. So your 3D, your solid will look like this. Because it's about the Y axis, I have to rewrite the Y equals square root of X as X, you know, in terms of x, so I need to square on both sides, so x will be y squared. And this will be the radius here, right? And you know this was at 2. The key information to remember here is that when we revolve about the y-axis, we want to solve the equation for x so that everything is in terms of y, right? The whole equation is written in terms of y. Okay. Now, our uh, typical volume formula was uh, integral a to b pi f of x squared dx. Now, this is in with respect to y, so I have to rewrite everything from in terms of y. So, c to d pi f of y the whole squared dy. Okay, the function is written in terms of y, not in terms of x. So you, um, everything should look in terms of y. That's my whole point. Okay, c to d. c to d will be the vertical height, right? So the, in this case, it was it started at zero and it goes all the way up to two. So integral zero to two pi, and we rewrote y equals square root of x as x equals y squared. So this will be y squared. The function itself is y squared, which has to be further squared. And so that will be y power 4. So I'll keep the pi outside, integral 0 to 2, y power 4 dy, which is pi times y power 5 over 5, integral. So the limits will be 0 to 2. I'll keep the pi over 5 outside so that I'll do the 2 power 5 minus 0 power 5. 2 power 5 is 32. The volume will be 32 pi over 5. Okay, so this is really cool because it's very straightforward in the way we have it. Now, if the whole problem came out the other way around to rotate with respect to, to x, it will be very similar to the previous one, just that we'll have to remember to uh, get all our bounds rewritten in terms of x. So let's just do that as a quick exercise. Okay. If we revolve y equals square root of x, about the x-axis. Okay. 
y equals root x then uh, you know we have to have this it's going to look like this and uh, we need to find uh, the limits from here so we know this is zero but where does it go for that because we were given everything in terms of uh, uh, y equals um, we were told it was bounded by y equals 2 and y equals 0, right? Look at this example, y equals 2. y equals 2 is a horizontal line. Well, I forgot to uh, draw that explicitly, but I could tell that it was up to 2. Oops, it's not a good-looking line. That is your y equals 2 line. Okay, so it's basically bounded up there, and this is x-axis is y equals 0, which is basically this one. So uh, we have y equals 0 to 2. So this is what we are given, 0 to 2. But we need 0 to here, horizontally. So for that, we'll have to rewrite the bounds. The bounds are basically your limits of integration. So y equals 0 means plug in for y as 0 in the equation and to solve for x. That means x is 0. When y is 2, 2 equals square root of x. Square on both sides, you get x equals 4. So you know that this end would be 0 all the way to 4. Okay. And now it's easy for us because now we can go back to the volume, integral a to b pi. This is with respect to x. It's rotated about the x-axis. So f of x squared dx and so a to b will now be 0 to 4 pi f of x this is already written as y equals root x so good there and dx pi I bring, bring the pi out in integral 0 to 4 x dx we did a similar one previously right so it's x squared over 2 0 to 4. I'll bring the 2 also out. 4 squared minus 0 squared. That's going to be 16 pi over 2, which will be 8 pi. So if we were to rotate about the x-axis, the volume changes. right? So don't think that it doesn't matter whichever way it, rot it rotates. So I want to make a mention of that here. Clearly, the rotation about the x-axis gives a different volume than about y-axis. And uh, once we get that very, very clearly distinguished, then it's easy for us to um, stay focused on the axis of rotation and use that to determine if we have to write in terms of x or in terms of y. So far, we saw solids of revolution by disk method, where uh, we were able to generate a solid. There was no hollow, no hole. So it was a solid that we got, and for which we used uh, the idea that uh, a, a, a slice of it would be a disk, a circular disk. So we used the disk method, which basically turned out the volume to be integral a to b pi f of x squared dx. And if it was with respect to y, then we adjusted it accordingly. The washer method, as I showed uh, initially, is when you have a hollow or a hole in your solid. And so how do we uh, find the, the volume using wash, washer method? Now, uh, this happens when we are trying to find the area between two curves. Remember that concept? And that is what this first figure looks like. It's the area between two curves. And uh, because it's not hugging your x-axis, there's a, there's a small gap there, right? And therefore, when we rotate it, as you can see in the next image, so you have the series of images. In the next image, when you see that it's rotating, you ro when it rotates, there is that gap that also revolves to produce a hole. And that's what you see here. There's a hole. And that hole makes... Um, uh, you know, there again, when you slice it, like you see here in the third image, when you slice it, you do get a circular disc, but that disc has a hole. And if a disc has a hole, we call it the washer. 
washer is disc with a hole and because of the hole you now have an outer ring and an inner ring kind of a thing right so the outer radius and an inner radius will have to be calculated because now we have uh, the hole and so the volume is adjusted so that we have the outer radius minus the inner radius being squared okay. so that will be the outer radius and the inner radius so if you think of the outer radius you can see that the outer radius will be the top function and the inner radius will be the bottom function so that again matches up because remember that's how we found the area between curves top function minus the bottom function and from that we will develop this uh, washer method to find uh, uh, volume of solids of revolution that produce um, a, a hole in the or a hollow in the solid find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the regions bounded by y equals x squared plus 1 and um, y equals x plus 3 about the x-axis okay so we can draw the diagram one is a parabola the other one is a line so we can begin to see that this is a parabola that's going to open upwards like this and this is a line that is a positive um, with a positive slope so you can see that we need to see where they meet so that we can sketch appropriately okay so uh, because it's about the x-axis it's all good you can actually graph it if you want using your graphing calculator but in order to graph it uh, with all the proper limits of integration, I would like to first uh, calculate them algebraically. They didn't give us any other information, so the limits of integration can be found by setting the two equations equal to each other. That's going to be x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0. This means we will have x plus 1 times x minus 2 if you were to um, factorize them. And that will be negative 1 and x equals 2. So then you know that this is where the, uh, the two graphs meet. So they meet at negative 1 and 2. Okay. So then um, at this point I can give draw a blind sketch actually. Okay. Because this is negative 1 and this is 2. Um, you know this is x squared plus 1 so the the graph will be uh, kind of uh, happening above the x-axis okay and then I know the uh, the line is going to meet it here right it's increasing ah, another color and that will be the area right this is the region which has to be rotated about the x-axis so this is going about the x-axis so if you were to kind of um, you know imitate this shape so you can see that this is how it's going to look with a with a hole in in between right so it's going to be that kind of a shape so and the thing is you don't have to draw all this actually to visualize it because all we are told is just see it as the top function minus the bottom function and that will do the trick okay so i'll come back here and say well volume if you go back here volume is a to b pi outer radius minus the inner radius squaring each one dx that which is the same as top function squared minus the bottom function squared so volume will be integral negative 1 to 2 which we just found okay. these are the limits with respect to x is because it's rotating about the x-axis that's going to be pi top function must be squared minus the bottom function remember we're not blindly doing this we are 
just reducing the uh, amount of work we need to do it to draw a 3D figure but we are understanding it as outer radius minus inner radius which in turn is top function minus bottom function. If you blindly apply it then you know it may go wrong in some problems so I really warn you on that to uh, fully understand and then apply it. Okay now the top function in this case was the line so y equals x plus 3. The bottom function is our parabola x squared plus 1. So let's keep that also very clear. I had one student who thought uh, that because parabola has uh, degree 2 and the line has degree 1, parabola will always be bigger than uh, a line. Uh, that is not only a faulty understanding, it just uh, shows that uh, the degree has no bearing on which function will go above and which goes below. The degree only tells us the number of turns and those kind of things, the polynomial element of it, but the degree does not make it uh, superior to a line in terms of uh, which goes above which, right? So there's no such thing, so keep that also in mind. All right, the top function is actually the line, so it's x plus 3, the whole squared, minus x squared plus 1, the whole squared, dx. the radius I'm just trying to supply with as much information we have about it this is the line this is the parabola okay bring the pi out because there's a lot of algebraic uh, expansion happening here that's a plus b the whole squared. You can multiply twice and foil. 6x plus 9 minus, same thing here, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. You notice how there's so much algebra to do before you can actually begin working on the calculus part of it. Uh, because it's a polynomial, I'd like to arrange it uh, by uh, descending order of powers and combining all the like terms. Okay. So that will be minus x squared plus 6x plus 8 dx. Right. Negative x power 5 over 5 plus x cubed over 3. Plus 8x, negative 1, 2 will be the limits. Okay, there is a minus there, I need to be careful. These negatives can get annoying, right? Okay, pause and then do it carefully. Okay, I will let you do all that algebra part there. If you uh, did it carefully, it should look like this. If you cleaned all of that, 117 pi over 5, and that's your volume. Find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the region bounded by y equals x, y equals 0, x equals 3, x equals 4. Well, these functions are very, very simple, so go ahead and uh, draw the sketch. We'll compare our graphs. Okay, here is my... Uh, shaded region do we get this yeah uh, actually I want you to if you got this that's amazing because you um, kind of got it got the idea very clearly 
Now I'd like you to also give me, um, pause the video now and go ahead and give the 3D version of this, okay? We'll compare notes again. All right, does it look like this? It's like a white trough. Now we can see that uh, this is a solid, it's hugging the x-axis and it's rotating about the x-axis. So this is a solid and therefore a cross-section will be a circular disc, not a washer. We're going to call it disc versus washer, right? So it's going to be a disc. There's no hole uh, because it's a nice solid uh, uh, shape here. And so this is a disc. If it's a disc, then we can go ahead and use the, um, the disc method. What does the disc method say? The disc method says volume is integral a to b pi f of x the whole squared dx. I'm using dx because it's uh, we're rotating with respect to x. So we got all of that. And uh, we know from this graph here, it's going from 3 to 4. So a will be integral 3 to 4 pi. And f of x is this x squared. Uh, I mean this x, y equals x. That has to be squared dx. Everything looks good because you just have to worry about the height of the function, the radius. Right? And that will be pi outside 3 to 4 x squared dx, which is pi x cubed over 3, 3 to 4. Pull out the pi over 3 and that gives us 4 cubed minus 3 cubed. Again, clean it all up, you get 37 pi over 3. And that will be your volume using the disk method. Find the volume of the solid revolved around x axis, y equals 6x, y equals 6, and x equals 0. Okay. So the graph should look like this, right? And um, if you were to take um, the 3D image of this, so just to make it easier on us, I'll just uh, draw. So this would be on the other side. Right? It's going to look like this. Which means when you draw this um, 3D image, you clearly see that there's going to be a hole in the middle. right? Meaning if you took a cross section here, See that? That's a washer. So cross section is a washer because of the hole. And if it's a washer method, then you really have to use the corresponding formula for it, which is integral a to b pi, you know, the outer function. So for convenience, I'll just say outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared dx. And that was nothing but the top function minus the bottom function. And uh, this was revolved around the x-axis, right? So that's how it looks like this. Now, um, we want to make sure that uh, we have our top function and the bottom function, you know, if we can see it distinctly. Well, the top function we can see it as y equals 6, the line. And the bottom function, we can see that as this, uh, this uh, blue line, y equals 6x. Right? That's the top minus the bottom. And we need to find the bounds though, right? Remember, we can see the bounds for the y-axis. You can see this is 0 and, you know, it goes all the way up to 6. But that's not what we want. We want to go 0 to this point. So to find that point, we need to find the limits of integration. So what we have now is actually the limits of integration for y, right? y is 0 and y is 6. That's what we have. So use that and plug it in the... Um, in the function y equals 6x because you really want to uh, see where the blue function you know basically ends it starts at 0 and it ends where so then 0 equals 6x which is x equals 0 
I put both as 0 and this has to be a 6. 6 equals 6x, six which is x equals 1. Okay, so that's good. We got the limits of integration as 0 to 1 pi top function, so 6 squared minus the bottom function 6x, the whole squared dx, because it's a washer. So pi 0 to 1, 36 minus 36x squared. You can pull out the 36 with, and keep it with the pi. So it's 0 to 1, 1 minus x squared dx. That's 36 pi x minus x cubed over 3, 0 to 1. 1 minus 1 cubed over 3, minus 0 minus 0 cubed over 3. After applying the limits of integration, you get 36 pi 1 minus 1 over 3, basically, right? That's going to be 2 over 3. Simplify that. I should get 24 pi because that's a 12 times 2. Volume is 24 pi. All right, so I hope these uh, examples are really helpful. And if you see a few question, questions in your homework that are uh, slightly off because they gave a slightly different axis of rotation and things like that, don't panic. Go through the explanation there. Look at the solved examples in our ebook, and that should help you through them. Okay. So just understand that it is the height from your, uh, uh, the, the radius is the height of the function, okay, from wherever you're rotating. We are, we've been rotating about the x-axis and about the y-axis, okay. So if you were not rotating about the x-axis, let's say, but you were rotating somewhere above, okay, like y equals 1, oops y equals 1, then you can see that the radius, right, the radius would be uh, counted from this 1, not from 0, not from 0 all the way, but from 1. So that is how you will slightly adapt to different types of problems, okay. All right, I will see you in the next video, which will be on um, cylindrical shells.